really the gist of it is going to be talking about obviously uh, changing weather and, and the, the thrust of, of uh, most of the work that's being done here in this room is looking at the effects of uh, climate and the production practices on corn and soybean, but also weather and, and also production practices can affect insects, diseases, and weeds as well. And so um, I'm going to sort of talk about there's going to be three main uh, take home messages from, from this real quick talk. The first one is is that diseases or that pests can be affected by climate, and that's, that's uh, probably a, a no-brainer. But um, there's uh, it, it's there's several different ways it can happen. We'll start with diseases. Um, really, the, the driving factors is for uh, plant plant pathogens, and then subsequent disease is going to be temperature and moisture as far as uh, the environmental conditions. Um, and just in the last, if, if you look at it, especially in, in Iowa, uh, where I'm at, in the last three or four years, we've had outbreaks of diseases on, at, on every extreme. So in 2009, we had a fairly cool year, and we had the most white mold we had in over a decade. 2010, we had flood years. We had the most sudden death syndrome we had uh, ever in the history of, of soybean production at, 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 in Iowa. In 2012, now we we're having the um, outbreaks of charcoal rot because of the, of the heat and dry, and dry conditions. And then in corn, we're, we're um, starting to see some, uh, excuse me, aspergillus ear rot. I'm not get choking up because of these diseases. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so, so, so diseases can obviously be affected by um, weather, but a second one is insects. Insects can also be affected by temperature, and so um, I'm going to go through three quick examples, uh, spider mites, soybean aphids, and Japanese beetles. Uh, in, in 2012, this is probably the one that's the most on our mind. In 2012, we've had uh, extreme outbreaks of, of uh, spider mites. They've occurred earlier in, earlier in the year than they typically occur. So usually it's spider mites, if they show up, it's going to be later in the season, usually mid-August or even late, late August. This year, and just like in 1988, because of the hot, dry conditions, we've had spider mites showing up in early June or mid-June. And really, if you look at these bottom, if you look at the two pictures, you can see there's parts of fields, or in, in some cases, entire fields that have been um, hit with spider mites. And, and these are not the easiest things to manage. We've had some fields that have been applied with uh, insecticides or miticides several different times um, and with a varying success. So. Um, spider mites would be positively, will respond positively to heat and drought. Uh, conversely, if you look at soybean aphids, this is some work that was done out of uh, Matt O'Neill's lab at Iowa State University. If you look at the effect of temperature on soybean aphid reproduction, you can look at lifespan, uh, days to the first nymph, total number of nymphs, you can look at doubling time, all of those as, uh, in, as temperatures increase you're going to have a decrease in, in all of those aspects with soybean aphids. And so um, this would be an example of an insect that would be, would be, um, have a negative effect for, as far as high temperatures. Japanese beetle is another one. If you look at this has been, uh, in, at least in Iowa this year, it's been a, a pretty big conversation because it showed up fairly early and it showed up in fairly high numbers because we had very good overwintering of it. And then with the warm temperatures, it showed up about two to three weeks early. Japanese beetle was introduced in the United States in 1916, and if you look at really where it's a problem, it's usually on the, the leading edge. And so if you look at that map, this is actually a little bit outdated map, but uh, the leading edge is really the middle of Iowa and, and even into uh, eastern Nebraska, South Dakota. So um, it's a little bit outdated. But what, what Japanese beetles can do is they, they uh, are hungry, and so they eat a lot of uh, foliage, and then they also can interfere with corn pollination. This is the, you can see the bottom picture, and it's uh, showing beetles eating the silks. So if you look at the life cycle of a Japanese beetle, if, and this is one that's uh, out of University of Illinois, where they've had Japanese beetles now for the last 10 or so years, and usually Japanese beetles, it, it, it overwinters as a white grub, and then it uh, will emerge usually in mid to late June. And so this year we saw Japanese beetles in Iowa showing up in May, and so we had Japanese beetles showing up on plants that, that were much smaller than normal. Japanese beetles also can be affected by um, things besides temperature, so this is one example of an insect that uh, can be affected by carbon dioxide, and so 
Uh, there was a study that was done looking at the effect of carbon dioxide and the survival and the reproductive abilities of, of Japanese beetles and the lifespan of Japanese beetles increased when it fed on foliage that was grown in elevated CO2 and then they also laid, laid almost twice as many eggs when they were feeding on that, um, that same foliage compared to uh, leaves that were grown in ambient conditions. So diseases, weeds, or diseases, insects, and then the last one is weeds. Uh, the driving factors would be carbon dioxide and temperature, and, and these would be the two driving factors as far as things that will affect uh, uh, weeds and weed growth. Uh, weed competition and also the, the different zones where they're going to be growing can be affected uh, by both temperature and CO2. So the, the first point was is that climate can affect pests in general, and then the second one is, is that any uh, production practices can affect pests. And so I think the, the talk that uh, preceded mine was, was a perfect example. Obviously, we want to be moving to increased no-till. That would be an ideal situation. And then as plant pathologists, we sort of sit in our corner and, and grin a little bit because that uh, typically is going to mean increased um, diseases, both corn, soybean, or, or really any crop that's grown in a no-till condition. And there's several different reasons. Uh, No-till conditions are going to be, uh, you're going to have more residue on the ground and, and a lot of pathogens will survive in the residue. You also may have a little bit higher soil moisture or a little bit cooler temperature soils early in the year. That might lead to increased root rots. And so, um, the, but, there, uh, but really every production practice we look at could definitely affect um, so, some one of these pests, either insects, diseases, or weeds. And so, uh, and that ranges from soil moisture how quick the canopy closes or, and how thick that canopy is, uh, the survival of the pathogens in, in the case of uh, reduced tillage, um, overwintering of the, of the insects or, or the attractiveness of the crop of the insects is also a factor and then also weed pressure. The example I'm going to show here is uh, actually a study that was done by uh, Dr. Matt Liebman in the agronomy department at Iowa State University and in 2010, this is again the year where we, where we had an abundance of rain and we had, um, we had he, he came across the street, the, the agronomy uh, building is across the street from Bessie Hall where the plant pathologists are, and he's like, hey, there's, there's something, something going on in my field. And if you look at uh, the picture on your right or left, left, sorry, um, it, it, that, that's, a, that's a, a snapshot of, of a, a rotation study that's doing there. It's a two year, three year, and four year rotation looking at corn soybean corn, soybean, oat, red clover, and then the four-year rotation has oat and alfalfa. And then just the, the other picture is just a close-up of it. So this is the yield data that comes from it, and if you look at it, you can um, just w without uh, considering pests, you can say you can make some, some pretty strong suggestions that a, a four-year rotation would be uh, quite a bit better than a, a three-year rotation or a two-year rotation. And so something's going on there. And in 2010, it was even more dramatic. You had two different, <clears throat> excuse me, this is soybeans. You had two different varieties. And then 2011, the, the effects weren't as great, but they, they were definitely the, the same trend was there. And this is why uh, the, the agronomists came across the street and talked to us. They, they walked out into their field. This is uh, the only difference between these two plots that you're looking at is, is the rotation, a three-year versus a two-year rotation. The, this is the same variety and also the same planting date and, and everything else. And so uh, something's going on. And so, they, so when we're looking at it, that happened to be 2010 was the year of, of our sudden death syndrome. Um, the, they had two different varieties out in that field. We had up to 100%, almost 100% severity of sudden death syndrome in, in the susceptible variety. And then the same trend happened. The, the scales are a little bit different, 100 down to 50, but the same trend. So if you had a four-year rotation, you have very less disease, a three-year rotation is in the middle, and then a two-year rotation, you have a tremendous amount of disease. And so um, this is something we're looking at, we're trying to understand, but um, if you just take a, a, a quick snapshot into that field and you, and you disregard pest, you, would, you could come away with conclusions that were a little bit confusing to start trying to figure out what exactly is going on. So the, the second one was that agronomic practices can affect crops and, and, and none, of the, none of these things should be a surprise. The, the third one is, is that uh, pests can 
affect the agronomic measurements. And so um, as, as, you're, as people have studies out there, you can be considering what pests are out there that may be throwing off things. And there's uh, a recent study that was done looking at, it was actually soybean rust, but looking at the, the amount of photosynthesis and, and carbon exchange rate in, on leaves, and they showed that there's over a 50, almost a 70% reduction in photosynthesis when soybean, when, the, when that leaf was infected with soybean rust. And so, um, and, and, and insects differ a little bit, and so um, when, when you have straight defoliation, you're gonna have, uh, that's gonna affect the crop, and it's gonna affect photosynthesis and, and the amount of nutrients that, that are being used by that, uh, by, by that pest. And so insects, pathogens can reduce plant stand and yield. Um, uh, nematodes, insects, and root rot pathogens can affect the, the root function, nutrient uptake. Um, insects and diseases can affect the, the amount of photosynthesis that's happening or the carbon exchange rate. And really you can, you can pick almost any measurement and, and that would, could be affected by some kind of pest. And then the last one is um, weeds, and this slide was added by uh, Vince Davis at Wisconsin, but weeds can compete, obviously, for sunlight, water, nutrients, and this includes nitrogen. Uh, the weed competition can obviously, can um, significantly decrease yields as well, and this just depends on the timing and how big the weeds are, how aggressive they are. Uh, and then one of the things that, one of the questions that we're looking at specifically, uh, the IPM team is, is that the excess nitrogen in the soil can be absorbed by early season weeds. And, and when these weeds are controlled with post-emergent herbicides, the nitrogen can then be recycled or, or released back into uh, the soil in, in multiple forms. And so this can be affecting um, uh, the amount of nitrogen or nitrogen uh, uh, emissions. And so uh, th that's the question that Vince Davis and his graduate student is and is trying to answer is looking at if, if nitrogen cycling increases nitrate emissions and increased weed biomass increases soil nitrogen uptake, does the increased early season weed pressure increase nitrate emissions? And so that's sort of a, the, the thought process behind one of our, one of our research questions. So in, to summarize, uh, pests can be influenced by the climate. Uh, they can be influenced by production practices, perhaps in response to the climate. And then also they can affect the agronomic measurements that we're taking as we're trying to understand things. And so um, with that, I don't know if there's any quick questions, but all right. Thank you.